Hello and welcome to the Looking After Nature podcast. I'm Karima, one of the Nature Recovery Officers at Hampshire Countryside Service and I'm here today to talk to Cathy from Frog Life. We're going to be talking a little bit about frog life. We're going to give you some facts about frogs and toads and their role in biodiversity. We're going to be talking about their natural habitats and how you can support them in your local area and also a little bit about how you can get a bit more involved. I'm really looking forward to talking to Cathy and finding out a bit more about our frog populations. I just think frogs are really cool little animals and I'm very excited that I have got frogs in my back garden as well. Thank you for joining us today, Cathy. Would you mind telling us a bit more about frog life and about what you do? Um, yeah, the Frog Life Trust is a UK national amphibian and reptile conservation organisation. So we look after frogs, toads, newts, lizards, snakes. And uh, we, as I say, we work nationally. Uh, we very practical organisation, working on the ground, restoring habitats, creating habitats for the species that we, re- that we represent. And we're also very passionate about involving new audiences into nature conservation and particularly disadvantaged um, individuals because they're often excluded and also disadvantaged neighbourhoods often leave very poor um, provision of uh, high quality natural environments. We were predominantly urban in urban settings and as I say it's on parks, small nature reserves, community gardens, allotments, schools etc. Yeah oh that sounds great, sounds like you're really trying to get the community involved and on board yeah definitely that's that's central to our ethos really is to work with people and help people give them and help people and give them the knowledge and the skills so that they can go away and do stuff on their little plot whether it's an allotment whether they're part of a community garden they're involved in a school or they have a garden but a lot of people as we know in urban settings actually don't have gardens so it's really important that we improve the local green spaces so that they've got somewhere to go to as we all know green space and wildlife is a huge beneficial factor on our mental and physical well-being yeah so how do you if you're working with a community and they don't have that green space how do you work with them I'm sort of imagining that you turn sort of try and help them turn any unused plots into something that's actually a more useful space? Yeah, we do. We work on a wide range of different spaces. We work a lot with councils on council-owned land and nature reserves and parks, allotments. So if if people haven't got their own individual space, we will take them or we'll invite them to come to a local green space. We try and keep it local for people so that there's no travel issues, transport issues, travel, et cetera. And of course, ensure that the sites are accessible so that all abilities can um, attend our events or come to a volunteer day. Or even, you know, sometimes we may just create or restore a pond without actually involving the locals in the actual physical works. But then they can go and visit it and we encourage them to go and relax and enjoy the new habitat. Yeah. Okay, so I'm interested in the name Frog Life. And you said, obviously, you cover toads, you know, amphibians and reptiles. So why have you gone for the name Frog Life then? Is there a special Uh, reason? I I didn't choose the name. Um, The name was given to Frog Life before I joined. So I can't really say why the name Frog Life was chosen. It's It's got both positives and ne- negatives, the name, because as I said, we do actually conserve amphibians and reptiles. And Frog Life tends to suggest just one species, frogs, but it's not, it's yeah. a far wider gambit. But then it also does have a lot of benefits. It's a name that people remember. It's a fun name. It brings a smile to your face. You know, it it feels sort of joyful. So from a public engagement perspective, I think it works very well. Uh, But as I say, you you do have to keep explaining to everybody that we are wider than just frogs. Yeah, Yeah, well, it worked worked well for us because, as you know, it was frogs in particular that we were interested in finding out a bit more today. And if it wasn't for the name, we might not have got in touch with you. So it's worked well in this case. Would you mind telling us a bit more about frogs? Like, you know, sort of why should we care about 
about protecting them? Okay, so frogs are probably amongst our most resilient amphibians. Uh, they can live in a wide range of habitats. They're not that fussy about high quality water in ponds. They can live in very small ponds. They can even just live in a plant container. So they are probably the easiest amphibian to attract. Well, they are the easiest amphibian to attract. And as I say, you can literally just put out a container of water in, a, in your garden or in your plot, um, and it will probably attract an amphibians. They are different to toads in that they hop and toads crawl. Toads are warty and frogs are smooth. People often think that they slimy, but they actually not at all. They breed ferociously. <laughs> yeah. So they have a massive breeding period and they lay quite a lot of spawn. Their spawn is laid in clumps opposed to toads that lay them in string in strings yeah. and wrap them around plants and uh, so they do lay a lot of spawn and a lot of people get concerned that they're going to be overrun by frogs but the reason why they lay so much spawn is because a tiny tiny percentage of it I think it's estimated something like between two to four percent will actually get survived right through to adulthood it's heavily predated by other wildlife a lot yeah. of it will just die naturally so often they lay it out of water so it can't survive uh, so there's absolutely no reason to worry if you see a lot of frogs born because the vast yeah. majority of it will not survive why we should care about frogs? Well, they're just part of our ecosystem. Got an intrinsic, they got an intrinsic value that we should care about them. But they're also a central part of our ecosystem. They are a food source for a lot of other wildlife, such as birds and small mammals and grass snakes. They also eat a huge amount of invertebrates. So they're definitely a gardener's friend, a natural form of pesticide, if it's all balancing nicely. they also a great educational tool. They go through a full life cycle, so they're fantastic to use teaching life cycles as part of the national curriculum. Uh, people are most likely to see them. They are species that you can see when you're out and about, whereas some other species are quite secretive. And they just have a fascinating lifestyle and they're just great fun. And it's really important that we conserve them because they are a very important part of our ecosystem. And globally, amphibians are declining at a faster rate than birds and mammals. So on a global scale, their conservation is a major concern. Yeah. I know that we are already experiencing a massive loss of, you know, invertebrate life. So that's quite worrying to hear, because from what you were saying about the amount of invertebrates that frogs eat, it's like, well, they're the next step in the food chain. And uh, yeah, that problem is obviously just going to keep going up the food chain, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and that, that was one of my questions. Well, one of my questions was going to be about why are frogs important for biodiversity? But from what you've just said, you've just answered that question basically by one of the things is, you said how many other animals eat frogs <laughs> and the tadpoles so what what was the number that you gave you said how many frogs actually survive into adulthood i think it's estimated sort of between two to four percent of, of the spawn that's laid i mean that's two difficult. to four percent that's yeah. really low isn't it it's yeah. very low i mean it's yeah. difficult to ascertain you know these are all estimates yeah. because yeah. there's very little research on this sort of stuff but you know that that's what i think they they normally say it was funny when you were saying all of that we i've actually got a small pond in my back garden and over the weekend we discovered that we've got loads of frog spawn in there and i mean loads of it and i know we've already got a lot of frogs in our garden because we had a really wet period during the winter and they were just frogs all over the place so I wouldn't say I was concerned. I was probably excited to find the frog spawn, but I was a little bit thinking, wow, this is going to be a massive population of frogs mm. in my garden. But like you said, not all of them are going to make it. So, yeah, and that was another question I was interested in. Do Where do frogs go in the winter? Do they hibernate? What do they do? Yeah, so all amphibians do hibernate, but they all only partially hibernate. 
So if the weather gets warmer during a winter period, they'll come out of hibernation, forage for food, and then go back into hibernation when it gets colder again. And it is one of the things that we think is having a negative impact on amphibians is that they're not hibernating sufficiently because of climate change, global warming. The winters have become warmer, they're shorter, they're not getting a full hibernation. And we are finding increasingly over recent years more and more reports of them either not spawning, which we think they just haven't got the energy, or um, laying very weak spawn, um, which could mean that they're just not really healthy enough. So yes, it's very important if you do have frogs in your garden or in your park or anything to provide places for them to hibernate. They like areas with like fallen with, with logs, fallen leaves, stones, rocks, compost, anything where they can crawl under and keep warm, but also forage for food, as I say, for when they come out, and they can also take refuge from predators. Uh, toads will tend to go and forest in wooded areas. So in the nearby woodland, they'll go and uh, hibernate there. But frogs will tend to, if you've got a garden pond, they'll tend to stay in the garden and hibernate somewhere suitable around the pond. But it, yeah. it is really important to stress to people, it's not just the pond that's important. Frogs will very often spend more time out of the pond than they do in the pond. They actually only need the pond in order to spawn. And so it's really important that we provide them with this mosaic habitat outside the pond so they've got somewhere to go. Well, we, we've just left out lots of leaves. We I raked up the leaves, but I just left them in a couple of piles instead of clearing them away. And we've got plenty of dead wood as well. So hopefully they're doing OK. You know that toads can climb trees and they do use bird's nests, which is something what? that we've just found out quite recently, and we put out a call for people to um, let us know if they've seen toads. This was found, well, in bat nests as well. This was found, I think it was, through a bat survey. They were doing bat surveys, and they kept right. finding toads in the nest. Uh, okay. And so we put out a call, and actually we got quite a few people coming back saying, yeah, in 1997, I saw a toad up a tree, and in <laughs> I saw a toad up a tree. So obviously it's been going on for a long time. We just didn't know. <laughs> yeah okay so what what is a good time of year to see frogs obviously it seems as if now is the time to see yeah. frogs born and watch that part of their development yeah it depends where you are in the UK obviously if you're in Hampshire it's a warmer county it gets warm sooner um, down south and then it gradually moves up north so if you're in Scotland you're going to see them much later than now than if you down south. But yeah, they will start spawning. I mean, it's all weather dependent. We say when the weather's um, higher than four degrees, they'll probably start coming out. And they will start spawning mid-February uh, if the weather is nice, like we had a few hot days earlier this week. So you'll see the adults during the during the spring months, basically. And they will be around right up until the later summer months. And the tadpoles will develop over a period of about 12 weeks. And then they will be juveniles and then become frogs. Have you got any advice what people should do if they see a frog? Have you got sort of information about not disturbing frogs or what you should do if you should find one? Obviously, we don't want people handling wildlife or upsetting wildlife. So it's fine to have a look at them. But obviously, you shouldn't disturb them, leave them where they are, provided they're safe, <laughs> and um, let them get on with their natural life. They, they, they're they part of nature. They need to live in nature. So you shouldn't take them indoors or anything like that. But we are interested in data. So you can enter um, data onto the Fog Lives Dragon Finder app, which is www.foglife.org. Uh, it's very easy to enter data. And it really helps us a lot. We You can enter all data, all reptile and amphibian data. And there's also lots of information on the app where you can find out what the animals are doing, what time of the year you should go out to see them, etc. OK, well, I've already downloaded the app and I've just told you I've got frogs. So I could enter that now onto the app, couldn't I? Yeah, you could. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. You could. And I don't know if this is a stupid question, but how many species of frogs do we have in the UK? So we have a common common frog, a pool frog. What sort of frog are we likely to see in our area then? Frog. Yeah. So where would you find the pool frogs? I've not heard of that. 
Uh, they are very special sites. You wouldn't see them. They they non public, non accessible sites. Most right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They. It's very secretive because they've been reintroduced. So most likely, we're going to see either frogs or toads. And how many species of toads do we have? We've got common toad and natterjack toad. Again, the common toad is the one that you're most likely to see. You would only see the natterjack toad on heathlands, mainly around Dorset. Um, and you'd probably be quite lucky to spot them. Yeah. Uh, common toads, you're likely to see in your garden or nature reserves, parks, etc. Okay. So the main thing that people need will probably need to know then is how to tell the difference between a frog and a toad, which you already covered, didn't you? You said frogs jump, whereas toads crawl. Is that right? Yeah, and yeah. toads are far more warty, and frogs are smooth, and toads tend to be chunkier. Right. So frogs are more agile looking. That's why they hop. And toads are more like grumpy. <laughs> yeah. Toads also got beautiful amber eyes, actually. That's yeah. another good way of telling them. Well, I want to see one now. <laughs> Which reminds me, I did see on your website as well, you've got something called the Toad Patrol. Oh, yeah, Toads and Roads Patrols. So we coordinate um, patrols across the country who, at this time of the year, they're all gearing up to go out. So toads are hereditary creatures. They're absolutely fascinating. They will return to the same breeding pond every year. But if infrastructure is put in their way, developments like road developments or housing developments, anything like that, they will still, they will still migrate across that same route, which means that quite often they're crossing roads often many intersections of roads and mortality is huge. Um, so these tow patrols go out as groups of volunteers with buckets and torches and in the early evening, because that's when toads migrate, and they pick them up, put them in buckets and help them across the road and put them on the other side of the road so that they can continue to their breeding pond. Um, they will do the same back. Uh, so they do this en masse in spring. So it's much easier to rescue them because it's done over a couple of weeks and there's lots of them. The problem is the autumn migration back to their woodlands, their hibernation sites. They do it more spasmodically, more spasmodically. And um, there's also the juveniles that are traveling. So it's a much longer migration period and it's much more difficult to monitor it. Some toad patrols do go out in the autumn. Um, it's also much darker, so much more difficult to see them, but not that many. But at least they're getting saved on the one end of the season. So what time of the day or night do these toad patrols usually go on? They usually go out early evening for a couple of hours. Yeah, it's uh, every day uh, yeah. for a couple of weeks. Uh, the, the group sizes vary depending on how many volunteers I got. Some of them are really well organised and got very got rotors and everything going on with their group size. Others are just small and might just be a husband and wife or a part couple that have decided to just go and help these toads near them. So it's very variable. Um, mm -hmm. And we register all sites, but the only sites we actually collect data from and use the data is where there's more than 100 toads crossing. Right, okay. Yeah, so I saw on your website there was a call for people to volunteer to help with this, but it did say they were looking for people to make a commitment because you were saying it's it's every night, isn't it? It's... Yeah, it's every night. It's, it's not for that long. It's, you know, two, three weeks maybe, but it is a commitment. But that's why most of them have rotors so that they're not expecting people to do it every night. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the well-organised ones will have rotors. Um, and there's all the information on our website again. Great, thank you. I think it's really nice for our listeners to be able to hear what they can do to help. Yeah, and if they go to the Toads and Roads website, they can put in their postcode. And there's a map there where you can put in your postcode and it will tell you where your nearest toad patrols are mm -hmm. and whether they're active or not. So that helps you to get in touch with the toad patrols. Yeah. Okay. How can people help? With that in mind, what would you say, what's the number one thing that people could do to help frogs and maybe all amphibians? Well, the number one thing you can do is build a pond. Uh, we have lost so about, I think it's estimated about 50% of the UK pond habitats have been lost 
and the other 80% are in very poor condition. So the greatest thing you can do is build a pond. If you look at our website and you look at our Just Add Water booklet, it gives you step-by-step -step guidance on how to do it. It doesn't have to be a big pond. It can be, as I say, a bowl. You can sink a bowl into the ground or you can build a bigger pond. The next thing to do is, as I say, is to provide high quality terrestrial habitat. Ensure that they've got areas around there where they can go and disperse to, and where they can forage, and where they can hibernate and take refuge from predators. Um, and those are the two best things you can do, and you will have great fun watching them as well. Yeah. Whatever you do, don't fill in your pond. Yeah. <laughs> Number one top two. Not a health and safety risk. If you're worried about children, put big planters around the pond to, to create a barrier so they're not falling straight into it, they won't fall straight into it. But really, there's no need to fill in your pond because you think it's a health and safety risk. There are measures you can take to make that safe. And it's great for children to have yeah. a pond and to see the wildlife. OK, so I did have two more questions. One was I just wanted to go back to what you mentioned about frogs and hibernation. You were saying that where the winters are milder now, that the frogs aren't hibernating for as long. And I just wanted to check. My understanding is that that's a problem because the frogs, they obviously don't have as much food over the winter. So they kind of rely on being asleep and resting. If they keep waking up, they're going to be needing more energy. And that energy just isn't there for them. Is that right? Yeah, and also if they don't, I mean, it's like anybody, if you keep waking up throughout the night, you're not going to feel particularly energised <laughs> in the morning. So it's a bit the same. They do need a certain amount of rest, and it takes an enormous amount of energy, particularly for the female frogs, um, to spawn. So they really need to be building up those resources over the winter. And you are right, there's few, there is less food source over the winter months, so that's also an issue. I mean, there's no hardcore... Uh, research into this at this stage it's just what we suspect is happening with the reports that we receive and then the other question was why do frogs croak because they were croaking a lot they were croaking a lot last night it sounded like there was motorbikes off in the distance and I realized, <laughs> no, it was definitely the frogs in the in the pond they will definitely croak more during the breeding season because they're attracting mates so it's like, uh, you know, they're croaking in order to, the males will be croaking in order to let the females know where they are. So there'll definitely be a lot more croaking during the breeding season than there would be outside of the breeding season. Um, if they have any other reasons for croaking, I really don't know. <laughs> I just know. It, it'll, do, it'll be to do with males trying to attract females. <laughs> yeah, we do that a lot with the birds. I was working on... Um... A project with birds before and I always just like to pretend I knew what they were talking about but <laughs> they're just asking each other if they're all right basically like <laughs> contact calls yeah so is there any way that our listeners can help to support frog life yeah so lots of ways you can look on our website and see what projects we've got running you can come along to a project you can join our volunteer sessions you you can, as I say, add data to our app. You can join a Toads and Roads Patrol. You can donate to us. You can become a friend of ours. You can leave us a legacy. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff you can do. And you can build a pond. And that all helps for life. So um, I think if you look at our website, we've got all our projects up there and all our events on our events page. You can see how you can get involved. Is there anything exciting in particular coming up that we should look out for? Well, we have got lots of events on, on the radar because this is the time of the year when we start doing our events. Um, it's a bit far for Hampshire residents, but our Mapistry is on tour in Scotland. <laughs> in the, so if you're actually holidaying in Scotland, you might want to have a look and go and have a look at the Mapistry tour. It's a community-created tapestry uh, reflecting the local wildlife within the Forth Valley. We've done them in other parts of the country as well. Our London team will be hosting a lot of volunteer sessions and events, community consultation for a new project that we're doing. We've got um, lots of events and stuff coming up in, our, in the Midlands. So if, as I say, if you look on the website, there, there's all sorts of stuff. We've just had a toad summit. We have a toad summit at the beginning of the season every year. Uh, that actually took place in Brighton, but it does travel around the country. So it's worth, if you're interested in toads, 
on roads, then um, with keeping an eye out for the one in January next year. Uh, so there's all sorts coming up that's really exciting and people. I mean, in the Midlands, we're actually creating Lego models, tracing mm. the geological history of the region mm. and how we went from dinosaurs, finally, to frogs and toads yeah. <laughs> and newts. Yeah, there's all sorts. We really try and make things fun so that people enjoy getting involved and then they likely to move on to doing other stuff brilliant thank you well thank you for joining us on the podcast today i've been really enjoyed your facts about frogs and it's really interesting to find out something new about our local wildlife so thank you no thank you very much i really enjoyed talking with kathy from frog life and finding out a bit more about frogs and toads. I think my favourite fact was probably that toads can be found living in trees. I'm now looking forward to spotting a toad up a tree. If you're interested in finding out more about anything you heard on our podcast today, remember you can check out their website www.froglife.org. They've got loads of information and they've even got a number of apps available for download including one where you can report your sightings, and they've also got a pond visualiser. Cathy did say the number one thing you can do to help frogs and amphibians is to build a pond, so do have a think about that. They've got lots of information on their website to help you. I've got a small pond in my garden with plenty of frogs in it, and I love seeing them out and about in my garden. They're like my little band of froggy friends. My personal advice of how you can help frogs is just to take an interest and find out a bit more about them and share your passion and knowledge with others. If you've got a pond with frogs in, take photos and share it on social media. We really need an army of nature lovers to help care for and protect our wildlife. We'd love to hear your comments and thoughts on our podcast. If there's anything you'd like us to discuss in a future episode, let us know by dropping us a message on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. Just search Hampshire Countryside Service and don't forget to follow for future updates. We'd really appreciate it if you could rate and review our podcast. It helps us to reach more people and means we can continue to share information about wildlife, nature and the countryside. Thanks for listening. See you next time.